Hey guys, it's Rebecca. I just want to pray before I start because this is pretty um, intense. So, dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray that you would speak through me um, the power of the Holy Spirit, that it may just be evident and every word that I speak will impact and pierce the soul and the heart of those who watches this video. In Jesus' name, amen. So basically, I woke up from a dream. Um, so in this dream, basically, um, I reached over and then my friend said, boundaries. And there was a bunch of people from my past church or even best friends that I had. Um, before I basically went to different countries and ministered. So I was not sent out by a church. I was not, I didn't have partnerships. I didn't have sponsors. I didn't have any of that. I just really had to trust God and I had to trust his voice. So it wasn't conventional. It wasn't traditional. It wasn't religious. It was just God basically saying, you're a pastor to lost sheep and I'm going to send you out. So, you know, I didn't go to seminary. Like I wasn't trained. Um, I just listened to God's voice. So basically at one point, um, I'll start from the beginning. I was born in Germany. I moved to Taiwan when I was five. I moved to America when I was eight. And when I was eight, my parents divorced. My cheat my dad cheated on my mom. And we moved to America and we struggled a lot financially. So there's a huge spirit of lack over me. And I, I felt depressed because I didn't see my dad for 10 years. Okay, so when I was 12, I received Jesus into my heart and into my life. And I started to hear the voice of the Lord um directing me to go places so i would be driving and god would say you know go now go you know um he would say go to the park uh pray for this guy All right so growing up i thought oh i wanted to be a fam famous fashion designer but i also wanted to be a missionary but i just didn't like the way that like people dressed <laughs> in church so i thought oh my gosh i don't want to be a badly dressed uh missionary and i don't want to live in a hut so i did have that calling i had that desire um for god to do god's work but i was like okay well i'll go into i'll go into fashion i'll be a light there you know i'll become famous and then so when i was like gosh when i grew up basically i went to fashion school i followed that route i went to work but then like Basically, I was pursuing, like, God was telling me to go into acting. God was telling me to go into different things. And he said, you know, at one point, he was basically like, sell everything and follow me. So I got rid of my apartment, my car, my car lease before it was over. And um, I just had to release everything. At that time, I had $200. I was at church and God said, give it all. And he said, whose house are you building, yours or mine? So at that point, then I had like a few pennies and I still needed rent money, right? I was still low on rent, so I still needed like 750 So at that point, then I was already late on rent for a month and two months. And so God was trying to break off the spirit of lack and the spirit of death or the spirit of men over me. So what a spirit of man or fear of man is basically when you're afraid of people and authority figures, when you're afraid of the fear of death is when you're scared of deadlines. So, oh my gosh, March 1st, rent is due. That is a fear of death. So basically, I overcame all of those things, even though it was scary. Um, and then the Lord led me to move back home where at, for the first time in my life, like I really got support from my mom, even though she was nagging and she was like, what are you doing with your life? So a lot of people didn't understand because I'm like, they're like, why are you giving up everything to to surrender to God, to follow his plan? And then God's just telling you to do nothing. <laughs> so, of course, like I felt really misunderstood and um, I felt just neglected and abandoned almost by God. And I was like, God, like, dude, like I'm sacrificing. So I already sacrificed so much. I literally sacrificed everything that I had, every couch, every utensil, like. I gave up every single thing. I had a few boxes that I put in my friend's house. And um, 
when you come to that point of surrender, it's heartbreaking and you keep you keep you just keep crying and you keep crying. So <clears throat> God told me basically to sell everything and follow him and move back home for like two years and God told me to rest and through that I learned grace. It's basically you're um saved by grace, not by works, not because you do anything for God, but because you are a child of God and you freely receive from God. So that was the first time in my life I actually got money from my mom so that I could live. And before I was like giving her rent money growing up in high school, I was giving her rent money. I was supporting her essentially sometimes, not all the time, but yeah, like whatever I earned, it was almost like just going back to helping my mom pay for rent. So in a sense, I didn't really have a childhood right so thanks for watching and um so basically 2018 God said hey like it's time to go so I was at home and um God said go to Taiwan so I went to Taiwan and I was crying a lot because I was like first of all at that time I probably had like 20 bucks and God was like hey like um trust that someone's gonna pay for your plane ticket just book it on your credit card so i booked a flight to taipei like a one-way ticket i had no other money or savings or anything like that and that day i told my mom hey in a week i'm going to taiwan i don't know when i'm coming back but god has called me to this of course she's like yelling or didn't talk to me she's like why would you do that you don't know what you're doing with your life you're almost 30 like what are you doing with your life like you don't have a plan i mean the amount of insults that I got from my mom is pretty incredible and ridiculous. But God has, I mean, Satan has used my mom in a way to thwart me and to destroy God's plan for me. But Satan has not uh, been successful, obviously, because I'm still here. I'm still alive and I'm still ministering to people on the streets. So basically that year I was resting, God said, um... I asked God, what's my purpose? And he said, you're going to pastor lost sheep. What are lost sheep? Lost sheep are either they're unbelievers or they're people who have walked away from God because of offense or wounded, being wounded by church people, um, which happens like a lot because people are very judgmental at church. Not all churches, but they're very religious. A lot of them are very religious. Not all. Okay. You're probably not one of them, but Anyway, so God's like, okay, since I have been kind of excommunicated from my church, when I left the church, people were really um, mean to me. <laughs> you know, they cursed me. Like, it was all kind of like just Satan using them once again to reject me. So I was like, okay, God, this is awful. I just served 10 years at this church and then people were persecuting me. Like, what the heck? So... God said, hey, just go. So I went to Taiwan and I stayed with my dad at first. And I thought like, hey, I'm here to build a relationship with my dad who I have. Yeah, thanks. Who I have not seen for like 10 years. But all right, God, like, um, but he was he would disappear for like a few days and I wouldn't know where he was. So I started to like minister to my aunts and uncles who had a huge and strong spirit of lack like they worked like 60 years had a convenience store and they were like wanting to retire but they still felt like it wasn't enough it like they didn't have enough and I was like see that's a spirit of lack when you feel like you've been working 60 years and you can retire and you don't yeah me, me neither I'm not a I'm not a weekly church goer. Actually, I don't go to church right now, obviously, because of the virus. But um, so, so I started to minister to them, and I was like, "Hey, you're able to, to basically like, oh my heart, you're basically able to retire, but you don't, right?" So I was like, "You know, you're not an orphan and or or a slave. You're a child of God, and God will take care of you." So, that's the beginning of. Basically, my ministry, I started to just walk by faith and not by sight. Um, I ended up going to more than 14 countries. I can't even tell you, like, how hard that was. So, in my dream that I just had, basically, like, all of the religious Christians in my dreams were, like, they're, like, boundaries and they're, like, this and that and, like, telling me, like, 
what not to do. And so basically, um, I had like a $5,000 credit card at that point. I wasn't supported by a church. I wasn't sponsored by a church. I was, I had no donors. Um, I just went with what I had, which is what maybe my mom gave me. And then eventually my dad gave me some money to help me. But I just really had to like, because I was like, God, okay, maybe I'll live in Taiwan. And then like, at least like, I know I have that backing of my dad, like in case anything happens. But God was like, no, like, so I started like, I remember being in Taiwan, I was at a fur, fur place. And this guy came in, he was white from like America or something. And so he was like, oh, my, um, I forgot. Oh, he owns like a scuba diving shop in Taiwan. So from there, I started to meet people who were lost sheep. They did grow up Christian and then became new age or they became spiritual or they just kind of like stopped believing in the church. And that's basically like most of the people that I minister to, like, they're just different and they don't fit in churches and they don't want to be told what to do. And you shouldn't be told what to do. God doesn't control us through people. And first of all, God is not controlling. God is loving. So my job is I teach people how to listen to God for themselves and not be controlled by like a pastor or even a prophet, but that they have discerning of spirit that they follow God on a daily basis. So Basically, I went to Korea and I was like, even the day I got to the airport, like I had nowhere to stay yet. And I was just like, God, and I just felt in my spirit not to book anything on Airbnb yet. And then when I finally did book, it occurred to me that that listing was not even available before the time that I booked it. Right. So I had to just go by faith and not by sight. And I didn't have like um a SIM card or anything and I was able to find the place. So this is the crazy part. The freaking Okay, I arrive and the first time I get there, like that night, like next to me, this lady has a TV on all night. Like that was the beginning of spiritual warfare that I saw, oh my gosh, there is a lot of spiritual warfare. So I had to tell her, like, hey, can you turn on the music? Can you turn on music? Eventually, she started cussing me out in Korean. And so I was like, God, like, first of all, I'm alone here, God. Like, I know you're with me, but, like, literally, this is how I need to do things. Like, deal with these people. And so I had to keep speaking up for myself. And eventually, <clears throat> like, there was a lot of different things that happened. But, like, eventually, I realized that Airbnb owner through talking to him, was a lost sheep. And he said, you know, I'm Christian, I love God, but I hate the church. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was here for you. Like, I was here for you. And so God would direct me. And at one point, I remember being in Korea, just walking around, and I felt led to go to this park. And there were Christians singing. And so I decided to join them. And the Lord said, hey, tell your testimony. So I just met them. There's a group of Christians and so I sit, I basically say, hey, I'm here and I feel led to tell my testimony. And so basically they had a translator and basically they listened um, and they were like, oh, we actually had um, a devotional about, you know, the message of you're enough in Christ Jesus. You've been made whole by his blood. Um, you're not saved by works. So when you're saved in God's eyes, you're basically whole. Like, when God sees you, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see sin. He doesn't see blemish. He doesn't see, like, oh, you're not doing enough. Like, you're literally whole. So, that was basically the beginning of ministry. But there was so much spiritual warfare. Like, places that I would go, I couldn't sleep. Um, there were, like, noises. And I could... Because I have very deep and intense spiritual hearing, I also have deep and intense physical hearing. Which means that something like um like a wiring i can hear like electrical wiring that's not done right or something i can hear high pitches i can hear sounds in the spirit and so when i got to japan it was like the same thing right so by that time i was already like basically like trusting god i'm like okay god i have a credit card i'll just use it and i started to prophesy to people and pray for people or just tell people about jesus remember this i don't just randomly talk to people like it it's someone that I feel led to talk to so that my heart is being led, my spirit, the Holy Spirit is leading me to talk to that person. So I just remember in Korea too, like 
there was a girl sitting there、um, eating, and she was like, Hey, can I get a fork? And so, like, she was Muslim. We started talking. She had a stomach ache. I prayed over her stomach, and she got better. And that's, that was a gateway for me to just share my faith and say, Hey, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And this is my testimony. You know, I didn't see my dad for 10 years. I felt like an orphan. I felt like I wasn't enough. But God showed me that I am a child of God, that I am worthy of love. And so in South Africa, like basically, I got to that country. I think I had 20 bucks in my wallet. And I didn't have anything booked. I didn't feel led to book anything.、Um, I got on this bus, right? And I'm like, okay, God, I have no idea where I'm going. And so God kind of showed, like, I asked around, and then I was like, I have a feeling I need to stay somewhere where there's like city center, like, there's a lot of people there. So I get on the bus, there's like all these slums on the way to Cape Town. So I get on the bus, and this lady's like, oh, come with me, we can take a taxi, and I'll show you. And I was like, this is off, like, something is so off. So I was like, no. So I get to the city, I get off the bus, and I just like, Whoever, I just ask whoever, like, hey, do you know, like, the city center? or So people would direct me, right? Eventually, there were these two guys that were going out and out of this apartment, and I just asked them, like, hey, like, do you know, like, a hostel nearby? They're like, actually, we're going to it because they also have a bar or restaurant. So they're like, we can give you a ride. So that's basically how I ended up there. And there, I basically. Every person that was in my room, they came in and out because I was there for a week. Every person that came into my room, I prayed, prophesied over them, I ministered to them, told them about Jesus, told them my testimony. And was it easy? No, because again, staying at hostels is like crazy. It's like a party all the time. But is it always fun? No, remember, I'm there to minister. I will have fun sometimes, but I didn't really have the funds, right, to be like, You know, so at that time I was like really worried. I'm like, God, how am I gonna survive? And I didn't have the strength really to like know how to ask for help or the courage really. So I basically, like, even at night, sometimes there'll be like club music and it was really loud. And I was like, God, like, I'm scared. But then I would start meeting all these Christians. So honestly, like, South Africa. I probably prophesied over like a thousand people. Like, even like I would go to a mall and I would basically like prophesy. Like, I would walk by someone and be like, hey, can I pray for you? And then prophesy over them. So, I had God basically put guts in me. <laughs> like, if I didn't have guts before, He put guts in me in South Africa. People were receptive. I would be eating at a restaurant and I'd see someone, God would give me a word of knowledge. Hey, like, comfort them, you know, tell them this, tell them what I'm saying. So I would pray over them, tell them, hey, like, God is with you, or it wasn't your fault, or something. And they'd be like, oh my gosh, like, my sister has cancer right now. And they, they start crying, right? So South Africa was really the momentum, like, of building. And God was like, you need to start a fundraiser. Because again, at that time, I was using my credit card. So, my fear in starting a fundraiser was that before I went on these Holy Spirit led trips, but people would say, You don't go to my church, I'm not going to give to you. You know, so <clears throat> that was really tough because I felt rejected again by the church. I felt excommunicated. I felt unworthy. So, again, a spirit of lack attacking me. So, I had to just be like, Hey, God, like, I trust you. Let me do this in faith. So, I put myself out there, made a fundraiser. I thought no one would give for some reason, but the next day someone did. A few people did. And so I was like, oh my gosh, God. And at, like, I'll also say that I didn't have the best relationship with my mom because she didn't understand what I was doing. She thought I was like wasting my life away. So in saying that, I didn't want to call her and ask for help. I didn't want to, you know, tell her the situation that I was in because I felt rejected and I felt like unworthy, right? So, I, that wasn't an option for me. I didn't have the guts. I didn't have the courage to ask her for help. And now, a lot of the homeless people that I reach or the young people that I reach right now, they are in the same situation because maybe, like, I met one guy, he's been homeless for five years. His parents have a home. He doesn't want to go back because he's ashamed to ask for help, 
again, a spirit of lack. He does not feel worthy of love. He does not feel worthy of help. So that's something that um, that I teach people, that it's okay to ask for help, that God, Elijah, asked the widow for a meal, and the widow was blessed. When you give, when you help someone in need, you are blessed for it. Don't be afraid to do so, right? So anyways, um, from South Africa prophesying, I went all the way to, I went from Australia to New Zealand to Samoa to Fiji to like all these places. So I just want to say, so I remember being in Indonesia, I was in Bali and um, again with the noise, right? Because I'm very sensitive to noise there was this one hostel and they were playing music like even late into the night and I was like hey can you turn it down so it was like the whole noise thing like I had to like speak up about it like there's so many places I have to speak up about noise or just speak up to people and confront them so a lot of times I would feel intimidated and scared like oh what are they going to say? And people would be annoyed. But I couldn't be afraid of what people thought of me. Again, that is having a fear of men or women. So I just remember at one point, like, I was in Bali. And I was going to, like, I woke up early. And God was like, go to the airport, right? I was going to Australia. And they were like, oh, you don't have a visa. And I was like, what? God, why didn't you tell me? You know, if you were going to tell me to go to Australia, at least tell me in advance. But, like, I, first of all, my phone was broken. I didn't have a working phone for five months. Um, so people are like, how did you survive it? I had to ask basically every single person on the road for help. And um, I got a visa. Like, there was these two French people in line, and they had a phone. So I asked them for a phone. I signed up for the visa. Like, I kid you not. And I met another Christian in line. I kid you not, I got the visa in five minutes. I got the visa in five, like five to ten minutes. And um, so God would just lead me everywhere that I went. God would lead me to people that, you know, I would tell them about Jesus. And I just remember one time, right, even in Bali, I was at a restaurant and there was a guy, right. And I started talking to him and it turned out he was Taiwanese too, right. So he's not Christian. I think he grew up like Buddhist. And so we ended up just talking for the rest of the night. Like he got me ice cream or something. And I just shared my faith with him. And so like things would always happen like that. Very organically. Like without plans. Like just like Holy Spirit. What are you like? Where are you leading me to? What are you you know? And it was just like I had to just trust God. Here's the kicker. Here's the part where like most people are like. Oh my God. How did you do that? So. Like, I was in New Zealand, right? And I had, like, $5 in my pocket. Maybe less. I have $5 in my pocket. And, like, God would just literally be like, okay, ask that person to buy you a meal. Ask that person for help. Ask that person. And I could not sit in fear and be like, oh, I'm so scared, God, no. Because my survival depended on me obeying God. So my obedience led to provision. Like, I think that a lot of times we're taught, like, oh, just wait on God. No, when you're following the Holy Spirit, when you're following God, like, you literally just have to go, and you just have to trust, God, I'm enough. God, the grace that you've given me is enough. Like, just do it. Everything in life, just do it. Like, don't overthink it. Don't be, like, religious about it. Don't be like, oh, what if I'm not ready? Just do it. Ask someone out. Just do it. You know, apply for the job. Just do it. Tell someone about Jesus, just do it. Like, don't overthink anything. Don't think, oh my gosh, what if I'm not saying the right thing? My survival depended on my obedience and just being like, I don't care what this is going to result to, but let me do it. So every person that I would ask for help, eventually it would be, basically it was an opening to sharing my faith and what I'm doing, you know, and just saying, hey, look, I'm walking by faith and not by sight and, you know, a lot of times I would say I'm a missionary just to make it easier. So I'm like, I'm a missionary, like, you know, like, I need help. I need help. And that was not something that I grew up with at all. Like, I was not taught to ask for help. I was ashamed to even ask my mom for help at one point. Um, I was very independent growing up. I, like, worked all throughout. I saved money, bought my own car, bought my own computer, 
you know, my dad was not present, didn't provide, right? Basically, and my mom thought she saw me like working since I was third grade. So she's like, well, she's good. I don't need to help her. <laughs> right. So again, that orphan spirit came on me where I felt like a burden. I felt like unworthy of help. And so in New Zealand, right, I'm like, you know, I'm staying at this hostel. Like, I'm like, God, I don't have food. And I'm like looking in the freaking like the free food box. And I'm like, there's a potato. Like, I'm not even kidding. But even then, like, sometimes I would doubt God, like, should I ask for help? Or should I ask people for donations? Or should I wait on you? And even that in itself, realizing that's legalism. That's legalism because you're basically saying, like, there's a right or wrong way. Of course, you can ask God for, like, wisdom and directions and instructions and he will give it to you. But look, if you're in need of help, It doesn't matter who you ask or what you ask. Just ask, right? There's no right or wrong way of doing it. Because at first I was like, oh, maybe like I'm supposed to ask the people who I'm supposed to prophesy and minister to, right? But at this point, basically, I just felt a lot of fear. I was like, okay, I had a fear of like starving. Um, And so eventually like, I started to just ask people for help and I didn't do that in the beginning because I was like deathly scared of it. I remember God led me to this one church. It was a Japanese church and I just like walked in, right? And God was like, ask them, ask if you can go up and tell your testimony. I didn't know anyone there. So I asked this like African man and he's like, oh, no, I don't know you. Like, why would I let you <laughs> tell your testimony? And so I was like, okay, great God. Like, he's like, I'll make a way. So during fellowship time, like, there was all these people, like young people. And I was like, hey, can I share my testimony? So I didn't know anyone, but I shared my testimony with them. And then so at the end, I felt led to talk to the pastor. Again, I was a little bit scared because I'm like, I'm a newcomer, right? So I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm a prophet, like... You know, I start praying over him and everyone's like crying. Like he's like sobbing, basically. So at the end, I see like an envelope and I'm like, oh God, I need money. Like, and then the pastor's like, oh, you should pray about how I can help people every day. And I, the answer was literally right in front of me, but I was like, I couldn't open my mouth. And another factor was there was a young person who said, how do you know you're hearing from God? I had this past experience where this church where they they were lying to us and blah, blah, blah. So how do you know you're a true prophet? Like, how do you know you're hearing from God? Because of that, it put doubt and intimidation into my heart where I was afraid to ask that pastor for help because here was a young person doubting me. So I was like, God, like, you know, I need help. But I didn't, I couldn't open my mouth. I didn't have the courage to open my mouth and just say, hey, look, can you help me out? You know, do you want to make a donation to my ministry? And money is something that I have been attacked the most with. Like when I ask people for donations, I'm freely asking so that they can be blessed, right? Because when you sow a seed into a ministry that is growing in the Lord, you're blessed because it's an internal investment. Here's the thing is that people get triggered the most over money because they have been lied to or whatever. But that is not where I'm coming from, right? <clears throat> so anyways. um, Okay, so it's a very long, long journey. But basically, there were times where God would say, hey, like, don't book anything. um, Don't book anything like a hotel accommodation, don't book anything. I will tell you who to stay with. So I would get on a plane with a one-way ticket, not know where I was going. So I remember arriving in like Samoa, right? And I was on an airplane and God told me, talk to the man next to you. Ask, like tell him about what you're doing. Ask for a donation. And I was like, God, I just met him. I don't think he'll give. Surprisingly, he did give. And God's like, he's going to help you. So I didn't think much of it. I get off the plane. It's nighttime. It's almost midnight, probably. And the Lord is like, okay. Actually, at that point, 
I wasn't, because I was so afraid, I wasn't really like, I was just like, okay, God, what do I do, right? So I start, I see him again, and I'm like, hey, can I get a ride to the city? I don't know where I'm going. Like, I'm just like trusting God. He's like, okay. So I get into the car, and there's a mother and two children. And so I'm really shocked. I'm like, okay. So they're like, oh, we're employees of his, and we're helping, we're taking him, right? So the Lord says to me, ask her if you could stay with her. So I was like, um, can I stay with you guys? And then she goes, actually, I was just cleaning my guest room this morning and I felt that someone was going to come. And it turns out they were Christian too, right? So, and her daughter's name is Rebecca Mia, which means Rebecca the gift. So it was her birthday and we, we went to her birthday party. Like, that's how good God is. Like, so weird so um basically i learned she had a very similar family background to mine um and we're talking about you know husband being uh not loyal basically and so it was a lot of healing that happened that week but so the lord was like okay whenever the lord would say okay go now you have to leave now because sometimes I'd be like, oh, I want to I wanna stay here for longer. And God would be like, no, your assignment is done. Go now. So, <clears throat> like, even times where, like, I went into town. And the Lord would lead me to, like, a certain place to get something, right? And then I would meet that person. And then I would randomly say, hey, do you know any accommodation? And they'd be like, oh, my God, my sister has this place. Okay, so I would be led to go there. And I would end up ministering to whoever was around that area. So that's basically how I lived for like a year and a half. Um, and I just remember going to... I was in New Zealand. And like I had uh, like basically reserved a hostel room on a card. But they were like, oh, you didn't pay. And I was like, what? Okay, now I have five bucks. What am I supposed to do? Which is the number of grace. I look over and God's like, ask that person for help. So I start, like, just every backpacker, right? I go to them and I go, hey, I'm a missionary. And honestly, I don't have enough for the hostel room. Do you have any change? Do you have, you know, can you make a contribution? And so they would give. And so what did they really get in return is that I would prophesy over them. So I'd make, like, a really quick prophetic word. Hey, I see you skateboarding. I see you drawing. I see you singing. I see you doing this. Basically, the first time I really started to get really visual visions was in Bali. There was these two Indian guys, and the Lord gave me a vision of him. with There was mountains all over, and he's like, oh my gosh, I live in a city full of mountains. The other guy, I saw him dancing, and he said, oh my gosh, I'm a guitarist. And so they were like so shocked, and they believed. They're like, whatever you believe, I believe. It's kind of like... I was like, well, Jesus gave me these visions of you. So that was the first time I got really clear visions. That was in Bali, right? So from then on, I started to get visions that I remember I was in, I think it was Fiji or something. There was a young man. He walked into the restaurant that I was eating at. And the Lord, I prayed for him and I said, hey, you know, you're not having good relationships with your dad, right? And he's like shocked he pulls me aside because he's with his cousin and he says, actually, he's in prison and no one knows about it. Not even my cousin. And I feel ashamed. And so I'm like, you don't have to be ashamed. You are enough in Christ Jesus. Right. So <clears throat> it was a long journey for me to really break out of certain fears and into boldness. It was not always easy. At first, it's like, OK prophesying praying over people telling people about jesus approaching strangers cool but then it was like now it's like oh learning to ask for help learning to ask for donations from people like even people i just met you know and it's like that's something that i think a lot of christians don't know how to do um like even my mother would say well it's okay to pray for people but why are you asking them for donations i'm like first of all people need to eat i need to eat like how is it fair? Like, if you go into a church and the pastor is feeding everyone else with the word of God, ministering to people, giving their whole lives and their minds and their brain and their emotions to people, don't they deserve to eat? 
Don't they deserve to be housed and clothed? Like, we have such a false concept of, like, if a doctor is treating you, don't, don't they deserve to be fed? So that really comes from a spirit of lack and spirit of unworthiness, feeling like um, people aren't worthy and that people who are working in the kingdom are not worthy to be fed. That's a false concept. That's a lie from the devil. And that's what actually keeps missionaries or preachers from doing the work of God because they feel unworthy. So they don't ask for help or they feel guilt tripped by people. I cannot say how many countless amount of people have come to me and say, oh, I'm not going to sow into someone who doesn't work. I'm like, I'm out 10 hours a day. You think I don't work? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I am sowing into lives and people are telling me all their problems. You think I want to hear about all this, like, all the time? No, like, it's a lot of emotional, like, stuff that I have to pray through so I don't get bogged down by it. You know, it's like... If you're just working at 9 to 5, it's like, okay, you're doing paperwork, whatever, you go home. For me, I pray for people, t- like, almost 24-7. Like, it's always on my mind. People are on my mind all the time, and I have to release it to the Lord, you know? But anyways, basically, most countries that I went to was, like, a one-way ticket. Even if if they require a round trip, like, God would make a way for me. Um... So I just remember in Australia, like, someone contacted me. They found my blog, and they told me what they were going through, that they were going through a hard marriage. They needed counsel. They needed advice. So the word that the Lord gave me was that she needed to leave her husband because he was basically an alcoholic and abusive. She hasn't really listened, but that's okay. Like, God will bless her either way. But through that, through these different divine appointments, even online, like, eventually, like, it was like, oh, okay, I saw God providing in different ways. You know, sometimes it was through, like, a random, like, I'll be in Thailand, and I'm like, God, how am I going to survive? And, like, something random would come through, like, a $40 donation, and that would be enough for, like, food for a week in Thailand, you know, because it's so cheap. But... I just really had to walk by faith and not by sight and just trust what the Lord and where he was leading me. And so in the dream that I had last night, right, I was telling my testimony and someone was like, how did you walk, walk through it all? How, you know, how did you exit that season? I'm like, basically, I don't have a fear of much because I've been basically almost homeless and I've al- almost not have food to eat. So I'm not scared of what people think. I have, now I'm back in LA. So I do the same thing. I minister to lost sheep. I go on the streets and I reach homeless people or I reach the youth. And I'm spirit led, which means that it's very specific about where God wants me to go every single day. Like if I go to, God says, okay, go to the beach today. So I'll meet a bunch of people on the train or like, while I'm journeying through there and I get there and then I meet more people, then I go back. But it's very specific to how God leads me. Of course, there is joy in it. Like, it's not like I'm doing it out of like, oh my God, this sucks. But I think the reason that I had that dream was um, I'm healing from a lot of rejection. I'm healing from a lot of persecution Um, People that I thought were going to be my friends the whole journey, like, they turned against me. Like, people I thought that um, were going to stay best friends with me, they they basically said, hey, look, I don't want to be solicited to in this friendship, like, because I was fundraising, right? So, I think it just shows the depth of friendship and relationship when... You finally ask for help and they're not willing to help, but you've always been there for them. It just shows how one-sided that relationship really was. That they're even willing to help you emotionally and do this. But even when you're in times of need, like, I remember being at a hostel and I'm like, God, like, tomorrow, like, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. And I'm like, Lord. And he's like, okay, ask this person for help. 
she was one of my best friends and she said no um she just got married she just bought a house you know and of course my mindset was like i'm such a martyr like i'm a martyr you know that's how i felt and of course like god was showing me no i'm i'm training you i'm pruning you i'm showing you that like you're enough like through all of this through whatever situation paul says i'll be content in whatever situation you've given me that in that situation i had to say i'm enough i'm not lacking this person might have this this person might be like freshly married and this and that but i am enough just as i am whatever situation i am in i'm enough and that was probably the thing that God pounded into my head every time someone persecuted me, every time someone ignored me, every time I had to ask for help and they looked down on me for it. I had to say, no, you've, I've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I am enough. I am enough. I am enough. And that's actually the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit, when you know that you're enough, no matter what situation your life looks like, what circumstances you're in, that you're enough, and you don't have to compare yourself and say, oh, look at what that person has, look at what that person has, but you look at yourself and say, I'm a child of God, I'm not in need, I'm a child of God, and God will always provide for me, and even if I have to ask for help, that, um, that I am enough in it all, and so that your identity is not based on what you have or what situation you're in, but bec- the blood of Jesus has made you a priesthood, a royal priesthood, that the blood of Jesus has made you um, reign on earth as it is in heaven, that you, are, you have spiritual authority. You can cast out demons. You can resurrect the dead. That's the authority God has given you. And... One of the things that I find very disconcerting in the church that I've talked to conservative Christians is that they do not really believe that they have full authority in the name of Jesus because I wasn't sent out by a church or with other people. They thought that's not enough. That's not enough for them. They're like, okay, you need to be sent out by a church because there's accountability. Okay. You need to go with people because you, yourself, you're not enough. That's basically what they were saying to me. But what God was saying to me at every point in time where I was being persecuted by these people was that you are enough. I have given you the Holy Spirit. I have covered you in the blood of Jesus. The risen Christ lives on the inside of you. That is enough. And so... What I see in church a lot of times is people sitting there waiting for the pastor to do something for them, to tell them what to do. They're not hearing God for themselves. They're not living out like the life God has for them. They're not listening to God's voice for themselves. They're just listening to a pastor. They're just listening to a prophet. But I commission you today to listen to God's voice, to listen to what he's put on your heart to do. And you follow God for yourself, not a pastor, not a prophet, not a church. Because these churches are closing down anyways. You are the church. I am the church. It's not a building. It's like we are a live organism. And we are living on a daily basis to be that church, to be that organism. So... It doesn't mean that you're doing things out of obligation. It means that you're doing things out of desire. Why did I have to go through all of that? <laughs> and I still question that sometimes. But the biggest thing is like, I remember having a dream where like people were waiting in line to see me. And there were 30,000 people. I've prayed and prophesied over thousands of people. But the biggest thing is that, yes, there are conservatives. They were very hard, honestly, to, like, talk to. And I felt, like, just, like, exasperated. I'm like, why don't you just understand? I want people to understand, but it is not easy to understand all the time. But, dear Heavenly Father God, I just pray, God, you would open the eyes and ears of those who may hear, who may see, Lord, what you are doing on this earth right now. That your Holy Spirit is alive and well, that, God, that 
you want to commission people to live out their best life, not in a way where it's out of fear or control, but out of love and joy. And um, God, I just bless those who watches this video. God, I pray right now, God, um, show them that they are worthy, Lord, that you have made them worthy, whatever situation they're in whether they're heartbroken or maybe like they've broken up with a significant other like a boyfriend or girlfriend and they feel a lot of lack right now i just pray that you would comfort their hearts heavenly father um thank you god for your grace and god we don't have the strength god give us the strength you know we don't have the strength in ourselves to really like live out what you've called us to but it's through your grace through your power not through ours god in our own strength we can do nothing so we submit that to you in jesus name thanks for watching um let me just sit let me just wave oh crap what happened oh okay there you go and um yeah remember to subscribe to my blog rebecca and of course if you like to make a donation to this ministry, you could do so on my website as well. Or on, there's like different links like under my profile to give. And yeah, your donations really make a difference. Basically, donations go to like food <laughs> when I'm out ministering. And um, like essentials and things like that. But I just thank you guys for watching. Um... Like, honestly, in the dream, man, I was, like, crying, but, like, I, for some reason, couldn't cry in real life. When I woke up, I was like, gosh, I hope I'm crying. But I wasn't. Um, Sometimes, because of all the trauma you go through, you're just like, I feel like I can't cry, you know? And it's really hard to feel um, because you're so done being attacked, you know? But I just pray that um, that this would, this video will help you, that you know yes it was a hard journey and like it's still hard but like why did i do it i think a lot of people are like why did you do it then if it's hard because nothing else in my life made sense except for god nothing saved me except for jesus i was in a time after i broke up with my ex in 2014 i was depressed right I was drinking to get away from that pain. I was crying a lot. But Jesus saved me. He basically like picked me up from like a bath mat and he's like, "Come on, let's go." Like he's like, "You've been living in in like fear. You people please. You're afraid to stand up for yourself. You're afraid to look a certain way in different people's eyes." Like, look, Asian Americans freaking they a lot of them have like perfect credit, they have savings, they have a big house, they have a car. They're given all that. But I didn't grow up that way, you know, I grew up with a single mom. We struggle a lot financially, so I try to be independent thinking that was gonna give me happiness. And it showed me no, like this isn't happiness. I was isolated living in a one bedroom apartment, but that's when I started doing like Airbnb. And God showed me, look, these are the people that you want to help. The lost sheep, the young people who just got kicked out of sober living. Um, the young people going to art school. The people who feel rejected by their parents. These are the people that you have a heart for. And not the not per se the religious people. That's been the hardest thing. Is I've been persecuted by religious people the most. Isn't that sad? <laughs> Considering that we have the same faith. So, it's a lot of wounding and hurt, but um, I know that God is healing me from a lot of that and, like, even telling me to talk to some people who hurt me, but, like, a part of my heart's like, okay, I don't, I don't know if I want to, you know, God, like, I, I don't know if I'm ready for that, God, because it hurts a lot, you know, but in order to heal, you need to basically hurt you know, like, when you hurt, you heal, but you need to expose the hurt to heal. So that's the annoying part, right? 
Um, but yeah, I just pray that, you know, God would bless you and all this. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Feel free to reach out. If this story resonated with you, please reach out to me. Um, it just means that you were meant to hear the story. It means that, you know, God wanted to connect us and don't be afraid because we are family. We are family. So a lot of people have reached out to me that have been set free from fear they've been set free from the control of their parents um people who have had a hard time setting boundaries with people have reached out to me people who have been attacked by demons reach out to me <laughs> um but i train people i basically got leads people to me that have a calling on them their lives people who are called to prophesy people who are called to pastor or preach but not in the conventional sense not in the sense of like Oh yeah, I'm gonna get go to seminary and get a degree. No, like the ones who just they take on the grace of God and they go out wherever they feel led on the streets or wherever, and they pass through the people that are not seen. Look, in the beginning, like no one applauded me. No one was like, "Good job, good job for praying for that person." No one was watching me. In fact, I don't even think anyone really knew about what was what I was doing, you know. And even in those two years where I lived with my mom, like God had me ministering to people on buses, but I wasn't like really talking about it that much. Um, I don't think I was really ready to come out of hiding. But now it's like, here's my whole story, right? So, anyways, God bless you. Thanks for watching. Love you. Bye.